Dear uncle, is everything you love foreign? Or are you foreign to everything you love? We're all animals, and the body wants what it wants. Trust me, I know. The blonde said, come in, love. Take off your coat. What do you want to drink? Love is not haram, but after years of fucking women who are unable to pronounce your name, you find yourself totally alone in the foreign food aisle beside the turmeric and saffron, remembering your mother's warm, dark hands, prostrating in front of the halal meat, praying in a language you haven't used in years. Hello, and welcome to Words That Burn, the podcast taking a closer look at poetry. This week's poem is something that feels a little more direct and a little more personal to what I'm used to covering on this podcast. It is a poem of true vulnerability that goes right to the core of its reader. This week's poem is Midnight in the Foreign Food Isle. Warsan Shire herself can only be described as a poetry superstar. She became London's first young poet laureate, and soon after that achievement, was contacted by none other than Beyoncé to provide accompanying poetry to her album Lemonade. Following that, she collaborated with her again on the Disney film Black is King. To list out Shire's career as a series of achievements and collaborations, however, does a great disservice to her writing. Shire writes in a style that seems to connect directly with her reader's emotions, like a live wire. She is unflinching in the way she writes about both her own feelings and inner turmoils, as well as the relationships in her family and the world at large. It is this, combined with her commitment to doing things her own way, that have granted her such popularity. Her direct style and crystal clear observation of other people is evident in this week's poem. Shire has spoken openly about the way in which her culture as a Somali Kenyan poet and her youth in northwest London have shaped her approach to the world. The duality of that upbringing with those beginnings is littered with contrasts, and Shire has spent much of her time observing the impact that moving from one culture to another can bring on a person. She has spoken at length about the ways in which her own powers of observation have allowed her to create poetry. She was once quoted as saying, I've always been very observant. I'd rather listen than speak. It's overwhelming the amount of detail I see in really mundane scenarios. Strangers touching one another, someone arguing on the phone, a man falling asleep on the train. I'll fill in the gaps of the story myself. On some occasions, though, there is no need for Shire to fill in that gap. The collection that this poem comes from is called Blessed is the Daughter Raised by the Voice in Her Head. Covered within it are a host of topics and themes, but one that is heavily focused on is her own Somalian family and ancestry, particularly how the difficulties of Somali history have impacted Shire's own family. Shire herself was born in Kenya in 1988. Her parents had no choice but to flee Somalia after war and conflict had broken out years before. As a result of this conflict, there is a massive displaced Somali diaspora around the world. This displacement and conflict has meant that Warsan constantly writes on those themes, focusing heavily on persecution and refugees. One of her most famous poems, Home, is often cited. It features the line, No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. That poem in particular sees a massive resurgence on social media any time a refugee crisis strikes the world. Much of her work focuses on the impact such crises have in the moment. This poem, however, looks at the lasting effect it can have many years later. Midnight in the Foreign Food Isle is a poem that looks at the damage done by transitions from one way of life to another by the ways in which they often end up as a tangle of the two for many refugees. Clinging to an old life whilst trying to embrace a new one. That problem is laid out clearly in the first stanza. 
Dear uncle, is everything you love foreign? Or are you foreign to everything you love? We're all animals, and the body wants what it wants. Trust me, I know. The blonde said, come in, love. Take off your coat. What do you want to drink? The opening question is the crux of the theme established before. In becoming an immigrant, are we foreign only in the place we choose to settle, or do we lose both places? Are we left untethered from two worlds? What follows that question is Shire's biological rationale for love and lust. We're all animals. It's clear that she's supplying logic to her uncle. There is a definite sense of sympathy present in the stanza. The use of deer at the very beginning of the poem suggests that Shire has some sort of care for this man. Then there is the qualifying statement of believe me, I know. Shire is trying to empathize with her uncle understand his position. She's explaining that we've all been there in the binds of love and loneliness. That sense of sympathy will only increase in the second stanza, but for now it is enough to know she cares. We may believe as readers that this poem has some element of fantasy or filling in the gaps, but in this particular instance Orsan Shire has been very clear especially when it comes to poems around her family. The truth, as vulnerable as it may leave her, is imperative. In an interview with Vogue, she stated, When it comes to my own experiences, I will speak about whatever is necessary. I'll be open. There are people who will call that brave, but it's really just that for the longest time, I felt desperate to read someone who had been through similar things to me. I have no interest in feeling shame at this point in my life. This stanza, and indeed this poem, is certainly honest. It is not a particularly flattering portrayal of her uncle. But its underlying message is more important. In trying to understand why she chose to write this, there is a very insightful quote from a profile done on her by the New Yorker. It really helps to illustrate what this poem is all about. It is in reference to what Shire noticed as she observed her family growing up. Some men, she noticed, tried to assimilate into British culture and avoid anything that reminded them of Somalia. But a sense of cultural alienation eventually caught up with them. This poem takes place in that literal moment of alienation catching up. It's about what happens in the aftermath of transplanting our lives. And in tackling that topic, the poem encompasses so much more. Racism, xenophobia, rage and loneliness. Our hint at those deeper themes comes from the mention of the blonde woman. The descriptor blonde here is not one we would typically associate with Western perceptions of Somalia. And so, Shire is relying on her audience's preconceptions to distinguish between her uncle's culture and this woman, who may represent Western culture, particularly British society. The woman's italicized dialogue reveals another distinction. What do you want to drink? The uncle of this poem is a Muslim, and so would likely not drink. That simple line works on multiple levels, as it shows that her uncle is not understood by his adopted culture, but also that her uncle must go against his own culture just to participate. Shire actually spent a great deal of time with this uncle in particular, interviewing him frequently. And truth be told, he had a very tragic life. I have linked the article below where she speaks about this, and I strongly recommend you read it. The cumulative toll of the difficulties experienced in this man's life are made clear to us in the second stanza. Love is not haram, but after years of fucking women who are unable to pronounce your name, you find yourself totally alone in the foreign food oil beside the turmeric and saffron, remembering your mother's warm, dark hands prostrating in front of the halal meat, 
praying in a language you haven't used in years. The message of the first stanza, that love is a natural thing, is reinforced here. Love is not Haram. Haram is another instant signifier to the audience of her uncle's belief. Actions deemed Haram in Islam are essentially a sin. In stating that love is not Haram, Shire has established two radically different viewpoints. There is her uncle's point of view, which struggles to comprehend a Western society that does not view sin in the same terms as his own, and then Shire's herself. Shire became part of British society much younger than him, and perhaps aligns more closely to the values from her adopted culture. In this way, she may have been freed from the dysmorphia plaguing the man of the poem. In the following lines, her uncle's logic for deeming love haram is unceremoniously laid bare. After years of fucking women who are unable to pronounce your name, you find yourself totally alone. Her uncle has never found true love in these women. Firstly, there is the use of fucking, a coarser way to refer to sex between a man and woman, one devoid of sentiment or romance. The other clue that is present is a microaggression of the woman being unable to pronounce his name. There is a lack of respect or even care when we don't bother to pronounce people's names correctly. Studies have shown that the effect of repeated instances of such things can have detrimental effects on a person's identity and esteem. Her uncle has gone through such a thing for decades, and now he finds himself completely alone in the foreign food oil. The foreign food oil is a powerful piece of imagery from Shire. It is an instant visual reminder of what this man has left behind, and by the very merit of being labelled foreign, reminds him of how he himself is now viewed. Shire deepens the image by listing the things available there, turmeric and saffron. Two things which to western eyes might be exotic and rare, but to those from places like Somalia are as common as salt and pepper. Her uncle is thrown backwards into memory of his mother's hands and halal meat. It re-emphasizes just how trapped her uncle is between these two worlds. The poem ends on a truly tragic, bittersweet note, praying in a language you haven't used in years. Her uncle's assimilation has ultimately been unsuccessful, but now he couldn't even go back to the life he left behind if he wanted to. He has become truly foreign to both worlds. Midnight in the Foreign Food Oil is a brief but powerful poem from Warsanshire that encompasses a great deal in so few lines. It is, on the one hand, a wonderful investigation into what can be lost in emigration and immigration, the true cause of leaving a life behind. Secondly, it subtly investigates the way in which certain societies are less than welcoming to those who settle there. Ultimately, though, it is a vulnerable and nuanced portrait of a man who finds himself at odds with his own life. There are hints at trauma and misery in every line. Her entire debut collection is filled with such testaments, each one seeking to better understand her Somali heritage and her relatives that went through so much. This is a look at the silent torment that people who have made every effort to fit in can often be left to. When we wonder why a poet might subject herself to trawling through such things, we must remember that Warsan Shire has always felt that understanding and giving a voice to trauma and alienation is essential to understanding and empathizing with immigrants in the modern world. More than that, understanding it is a way to avoid the damage that it can do. Perhaps she puts it best herself. Here she is in an interview with Tracy Clayton in 2022. So poetry is a big, big, big part of why I am steady and why 
I didn't turn out unfortunately like a lot of people in my family and um, my community there's a lot of like um you know self-destructive um, responses to trauma which makes complete sense but I didn't want to get caught up in that um because I was really really stuck in it in my teenage years what did you think of the poem I'd like to point out as always that this is my interpretation but I'd love to hear yours you can get in touch with me in a few different ways send me an email at words that burn podcast at gmail.com I'm on Instagram at words that burn podcast and Twitter at words that burn you can find the script for this episode complete with citations and reference on Substack the link is is in the description if you enjoyed the episode please consider leaving me a review wherever you listen it helps me out massively even better if you know someone that would enjoy this episode send it to them directly that's all for this week thank you very much once again for giving me your time